Hi, I'm Oliver and this is Deep Cuts, a channel dedicated to music for lovers of music. We're in September. Jesus Christ, how have we already gotten to September? We're now two months into the patron fueled Deep Cuts channel. So thank you once again for all of you who are pledging support to this channel and keeping it going because without your support, I wouldn't be doing this video today. You may have noticed a slight change in the background, different colored furniture, slightly different light. I finally moved into my new house to start my master's degree, uh, but for the next two weeks, I'll be back in the original location shooting those, and then I'll be back here again in October. So, you know, apologies for the confusion, but this is what it will look like from October onwards. As I always say, please come and join the Deep Cuts Discord if you've never visited before. I do editorial listening parties every Tuesday where I sit and lead a listening party. We listen to different records, something that's based on a video I've usually done. I always mention it at the end of the video, but I wanted to mention it at the beginning because it's a great community and I hope more of you will come and say hello, introduce yourself and get involved in some of the events that we're doing. We also do Q and A's for the patrons. I do that once a month and I'm doing one this Tuesday. So if you're a $2 plus patron, then you can come along and for an hour I will answer all your questions and uh, everyone takes the piss out of me in the chat. So it's good fun. So come and join. If you've never visited before, just come and say hello. I don't like Tirza Devotion. Tirza is a London-based singer-songwriter and her debut album has been produced by the one and the only Mika Levy. Tirza's brand of sleepy R&B is definitely not for everybody. There are numerous moments on this record where it feels as if there isn't enough musical elements to keep a track going and they just sort of stutter to a halt. There are many moments like that and I think that is a conscientious decision. So it is a matter of preference. I just felt personally like that approach to creating a record wasn't particularly compelling. A track like Do You Know with its languorous beat and occasional stutters framing tears as very leisurely vocal delivery. It reverbs appear and disappear. It all feels very transitory. And this is the approach throughout the rest of the record, which undeniably makes it feel quite singular as a piece of work, which you could see as a positive, but it also means it lacks any sense of progression. I just was really hoping Tirza was gonna pull something out of her back pocket at some point on this release. Um, and unfortunately, she never really did. Before you know it, you're at the end of this very unhurried, languorous piece of work. Affection has a lovely piano chord which is looped throughout the entire track. It becomes the sole piece of backline for Tears' vocal delivery, which was quite nice, but it all felt a little bit inconsequential, to be honest, and that's how I felt about this entire record, which is a shame for a debut record, because I think, as an artist, Tears has more to offer than this. So I hope whatever she follows up with is more compelling than what is on offer on this record. I don't mind idols. Joy is an act of resistance. Yes, this was painful for me. As someone who was such a massive fan of their debut record, Brutalism, back in 2017, to the point where I didn't stop talking about it almost every single week on every single video. It was the top three record of the year for me. I just thought it was a wonderful piece of work from the Bristol-based punk band. Um, so I was really, really getting ready to love this record, like everybody else seems to be. It felt as if these guys could do no wrong, to be honest. Joe Talbot and co have been up and down the country, touring, tearing venues apart and spreading that love and that feeling of unity that comes through on their music previously and has come through on this new record, Joy is an Act of Resistance, and I cannot fault them for their approach as a band. They, they really do want to unify people through music and talk about important topics. They have a political streak in their music. All of those things are very positive. What I found immediately after first listening to this new record, Joy is an Act of Resistance, though, was that the fury of brutalism wasn't here for me. Those essential sounding tracks like 1049 Gotho, Mother, Stendhal Syndrome, the, the tracks that really made Brutalism what it was. I felt there was nothing comparable on this record at all. Somehow Joy seems to have very few of those moments, which really surprised me. Open a Colossus I really liked when they released it as a single, but it feels a bit too laboured as an opening track. It feels as if Talbot's voice is no longer flecked with spit and blood as it was previously. Love Song has that post-punk tension that they're so good at, and it's an okay track, but it just doesn't feel essential. And, and that's the thing that Brutalism felt from me, start to finish. Everything felt so essential, so perfectly placed. And there are so many moments on this record where I just thought, eh, so it's an okay track, but it just does not have that compelling feature. There's also a sense that some of that enigmatic, subtle quality that they had on Brutalism is gone now. And I, that is a conscious decision, as you can see from the title. Joy is an act of resistance. The lyrics are much blunter in focus than they were previously. But sometimes that means that the... Uh, the effect of the lyrics are also blunted. So for example, on Danny Nadelko, there's that one moment before the chorus where he just shouts unity. And it just seems a bit slogan-tastic. It just doesn't feel like 
just shouting unity doesn't inspire unity, I don't think. It's just a word, and I feel like more effort needs to go in if we're going to explore those topics. It just felt a little bit trite, I suppose. And it's same on the track television, which is talking about the standards of beauty in our contemporary society, which is fine. But then the lyrics are, you know, because I smash mirrors and fuck TV. Is television really the focus you want to focus on in 2018? Is that not a little bit archaic now, perhaps? I don't know. It just felt as if some of this was a little bit off in terms of the lyrics, even though I can't deny their willingness to try and talk about important topics and want to have meaning in their music. It just feels... Yeah, sometimes a little bit forced. It's not all underwhelming though. There's a lovely streak of humour that goes throughout this record as with their previous tracks on Never Fight a Man with the Perm. There's that great line, you're just one big neck with sausage hands. That whole verse is brilliant. And there's also the chant of 10 points to Gryffindor on the track Ram Rock. So there are moments where their personality really does shine through as it did before. And if you go and see them live, you have a chance to go and see them live, you get to see that in an even more visceral way. I also wholly admit that perhaps a lot of my reaction to this record is a result of my own inflated hype from liking the last record so much. And it might be that with time, I enjoy this album a lot more, but I do definitely have some issues with it. And uh, it was just so disappointing to me because you all know how much I love that previous record. I know that a lot of you are going to disagree with me on this one. So I'm keen to have a discussion about it in the comments section. Let me know what you think. Animal Collective, Tangerine Reef. So as some of you probably know, I'm not the biggest Animal Collective fan. I find a lot of their music ponderous and obtuse to the point of irritation. That doesn't mean I've never liked anything I've ever done. I mean, I like Strawberry Jam. I've listened to Merryweather Post Pavilion quite often. But it, in general, I, I find their approach to music just a little bit frustrating. So Tangerine Reef is an audio-visual release. And if you're going to listen to this record, you may as well take the time to experience it in the way the band intended. So there is a video on their website, which is the length of the record. And it's gorgeous imagery of glide tracked, slow motion underwater visuals of coral and fish. And it, and it is beautiful and it does add something. And I think you should, if you're going to listen to this record and try and discover it and get into it you may as well do it in the way the artist intended so if you're going to listen to it do head to the website and check that out as far as the music goes it probably actually is one of the most ponderous animal collective releases ever which actually does have its merits and its drawbacks because it's an audio visual release and it's connected to the big video that they've put out as well part of that works quite well because it's a languid delivery and i've used the word languid already on the tears of record in a different way though you know some of these tracks genuinely sound as if they've been submerged which makes sense in terms of the subject matter. I did find a track like Inspector Gadget or Jake and Me quite successful. They fit that hazy aesthetic that they were going for, that submerged underwater floating. At the same time, it's a release that suffers from a lack of focus. AV Tear and Co like to obfuscate their music. They like to obfuscate melodies. That's kind of their shtick. They like to have a lot of reverb on everything. They like to go off in these wayward moments that will uh, maybe challenge the listener in some ways. And it might work in terms of subject matter on this record, but in terms of memorable hooks and lines and something to come away with, you really don't come away with much. Now, I remember the visual component of this project way more than the audio component, and I don't know if that was necessarily the intention. So yeah, it, it was fine. I like Igloo Ghost, Clear Tammy and Steel Mogu. So I talked about electronic musician Seamus Malia's Igloo Ghost record Near Wax Bloom last year. I loved it. It's a fusion of wonky IDM, instrumental hip hop, and he manages to package all those things together in a very idiosyncratic way. Nobody makes music like Igloo Ghost at the moment. I was lucky enough to catch him at a tiny venue in Ramsgate on the south coast of England back in February. And when I'm saying tiny, I mean there was maybe 40 of us there. And he played some of the material from these EPs. And straight away I noticed that everything that he seems to be doing post Neo Wax Bloom is hyper-focused with his very strange and original way of creating and producing music. Judged separately, the EPs operate as two contrasting moods, if that wasn't painfully clear by the album art. And I think Clear Tammy is the more effervescent of the two releases. It's more indicative of what Neo Wax Bloom sounds like, even down to that cover art, whereas Steel Mogu forges a different path. It's more unrelenting. It attacks the listener more with hyperactive beats and flurrying melodies. And the thing is, if you're already sold on Igloo Ghost sound, you are going to enjoy these EPs because they are very much an extension of what he's already made before. On the title track, Clear Tammy, Malia raps in his made-up language and he incorporates lush piano performances, strings and acoustic bass to his digital bum rush. And it 
works so well. Nama Saw's Shrine Hacker could feasibly be the best track he's ever put out, and I don't say that lightly. The track Steel Mogu is more pensive, and there is less to offset the intensity of the beats, which makes it a much more unrelenting listen than a lot of the previous stuff on Neo Wax Bloom. And in general, I think the three song run on Steel Mogu of Blacklight Ultra, May Mode and Night Racer displays the most potential moving forward because it is markedly different from Neo Wax Bloom. It is more tense, it's more difficult, and I think it's actually more rewarding as well. I wanna see him explore that darker side of his musical palette because I think there are some fascinating things to come out of it, and I think Steel Mogu displays so much potential. And that's not to say I don't like Clear Tammy, because I do, because I really like Neo Wax Bloom. I'm just intrigued to see where Malia's palette is gonna take him next. Foxing, Nearer My God. Missouri band Foxing's third record, Nearer My God, is a brave record, I think, because it manages to balance idiosyncrasy and propulsive rock to create something genuinely original and compelling. It reminds me of, let's say, um, the band Everything Everything, but slightly more rocked up. That's something close to what Foxing deliver on this record. They're a band that's been caught up in the glut of fourth wave emo revival, and they get stuck with that label. And I think it's an unfair label because I don't think if you listen to Nero My God, you will hear much of that in their palette at all. I think what they've done is try to experiment sonically on this record, and although they don't always land on their feet, more often than not they do, and that is, I think, something to be admired. I've heard people recommending that if you liked The Hotelier's Goodness, which was another very good record that seemed to come out of that emo fourth wave revival tag, um, you will like this record. So, and the reason I'm, I'm trying to convince you is because I think a lot of people haven't checked this record out, and I think they're missing out on something that they will probably enjoy quite a lot. So try and ignore the fourth wave emo revival tag, whatever the hell that tag means anyway, because this record isn't really that. It's it's a bit of synth rock. There's a bit of art rock in there. Opening track Grand Paradise has sequenced hand claps, falsetto group vocals, and an overdriven guitar drop that has just enough distortion to make it feel a bit grungy without offsetting the playful musical elements on the rest of the track. The title track plays it a little bit safer, but it's still an enjoyable track, and it's certainly safer than Five Cups, which is the centerpiece of the record, which is essentially a nine-minute ambient track they've thrown in the middle, which some could argue offsets the sequencing slightly. Um, but again, I just I admire their bravery in doing that because it's not something that you would necessarily want to put slap bang in the middle of your record. But I think in in many ways it worked quite well. Trapped in Dillard's is an absolute highlight. There's this bleeping synth line with reserved piano and Connor Murphy's wistful vocal delivery. A strong release, please take a listen. Midair Thief, Crumbling. This one was actually recommended to me by Matt on the production team for the Patreon, and I was pleasantly surprised. It was something I've ended up returning to quite a lot of times in August, and it, it's been a bit of a ray of sunshine this month, actually. A South Korean artist fusing electronica and folk, these eight tracks on this record, Crumbling, feel like a gentle glide through pastoral landscapes that occasionally you get a kaleidoscopic visual for. Just imagine a field, a very naturalistic field, but then the sky is just full of kaleidoscopic, vibrant neon colours. It's got that kind of juxtaposition in its music. The synth pop on the first track, Y, bursts into the track just as quickly as it disappears and it joins these strummed guitars and treated vocals. The second track, Are ah, These Chains, is a delight, mainly due to how many times it switches up stylistically throughout its only five minute running time. And it's not in a way that feels academic or po-faced, it actually feels natural. It feels like this record's flowing despite changing constantly. And I think that's the difficult balance to make if you're gonna make music that's slightly stranger and less structurally simplistic. And this, this band, this artist has pulled this off. It's a beguiling listen, which is why I wanted to highlight it. It's strange, surreal, but with piercing moments of beauty. I love. Hermit and the Recluse, Orpheus versus the Sirens. Hermit and the Recluse is a hip hop project from producer Animos and Brownsville's Car, and it's a weighty concept record, which is so successful because of Car's thoughtful delivery and lyricism, and Animos's distinctive production approach. The concept of this record, Orpheus versus the Sirens, is Greek mythology. And what Carr does is he takes the idea and the concept of Greek mythological figures and he fuses them with his own life experiences in a way that is genuinely intoxicating. First track, Sirens, has a beautiful string sample, funky bass motif, and the only percussion is this occasionally pulsing bass drum, which is hyper-focused in terms of production. It also allows space for Carr's very 
complex, dexterous vocal delivery. On the track Atlas, Carr relates his responsibilities, his life responsibilities to the god Atlas, who was forced and punished to hold up the sky for all eternity. Ouch, right? I can barely lift a kilogram weight. That's a joke. It's lofty, um, but it's such a clever way of connecting these two spaces, myth and reality colliding. A track like The Punishment of Sisyphus is a wonderful display of Animos' production. I honestly think I could listen to this record with the instrumentals alone because they are so well produced, but honestly, with Carr and Animos together, they are unbeatable. This is a fantastic, fantastic record. Probably one of the best things I've heard in the past few months. Mitski, Be the Cowboy. Definitely a hyped release. I mean, who didn't love Mitski's Puberty 2 released in 2016? I don't think I've ever come across anybody who didn't. Mitski Miyawaki is an American Japanese songwriter and her fifth album, Be The Cowboy, is probably one of my favorite albums of 2018. Very vulnerable lyrically, Mitski bears her soul with words that cut and resonate far more than you might imagine them to. On the bridge of lonesome love, for example, because nobody butters me up like you and nobody fucks me like me. The toxicity of relationships and the sadness in missed opportunities is a through line on Be The Cowboy. And she wears her heart on her sleeve throughout these very breezy 14 tracks uh, that almost operate as kind of vignettes, but not in a negative way. It's a pretty short project. No song really outshines its welcome. I think you meant outstays its welcome, you tit. And I know that has actually been an issue for some people with this album. They felt as if more tracks should have been fleshed out and taken longer to develop. But I actually feel as if this approach does wonders for this record because I felt every single track in this 14 track record felt essential. And it, when it ended, I just wanted to play the track again. And is that not the, the best compliment for a track is that you want to hear it all over again once it's ended. It made every track feel like this brilliant little nugget of introspection, something I just wanted to labor over and listen to over and over again. And you know, I've listened to it probably 10 or 11 times at this point. I feel like I know every single word. I, I really do think this is a special piece of work. Instrumentally, each track has one element that really makes it soar. So on Giza, which is the opening track, it's that soaring string line. The brass on me and my husband, the spare piano on a horse named Cold Air, which has a very haunted chord progression, only increased by Mitski's reverb vocals. Find me a more heartbreaking closer this year than Two Slow Dancers, a, a track which is about a couple reuniting in a school gymnasium years later and attempting to rekindle something which will never be rekindled again. Bravo, Mitski. Bra bloody vo. Blood Orange, Negro Swan. It's the ambient R&B record of the year. <laughs> Just hear me out on this one. Dev Hines, aka Blood Orange, has barely put a foot wrong in his career, in my eyes. Test Icicles were great, his folky Lightspeed Champion project was great, and now Blood Orange, in which Freetown Sound was released last year, Cupid Deluxe before that. Uh, Freetown Sound was a record which was very tightly constructed, it had important messages, it had grooves that stuck in your head for days. He is just a formidable songwriter. Negro Swan is like a progression from Freetown Sound, and to some extent Dev has made the decision to move away from the tight song structures, and he's created something which effortlessly flows from one idea to the next. It feels like a constantly developing, constantly churning piece of work where everything is connected, but every little moment offers something completely different as well. There is a contradiction in that, I understand that. It just feels as if the, the music drifts in your ears, it inhabits your mind, it drifts away, it returns again. Uh, and that's very much the feeling I got the entire way through this record. This is what I mean about ambient R&B, ideas that coalesce, interweave, flow, exit stage left, reappear. And without ever feeling inconsequential or half-baked, Every, everything feels as if it has been put there in a meaningful way and it's been sequenced meaningfully, but the way it's done is just so effortless. On Take Your Time, a gentle guitar and vocal line is replaced with this impassioned flute motif. It's a lushly orchestrated moment that just feels so well placed despite coming almost out of nowhere, and it's quite surprising the first time you listen to it. A really beautiful moment on this record. Hines really did this record a service by making it sound the best it possibly could production-wise. I do feel like it's faultless. A track like Charcoal Baby's synths and sequenced beats fit alongside the guitar and bass lines just so well. Every single component 
it's just it's like a puzzle piece and he's put it together perfectly and there are no gaps no spaces everything has just come together in an incredibly well realized way this production helps present the subject matter of this record so well and it much of it's about depression and the oppression of people of color the way people feel in the lgbtq community uh, there are it's very much the central focus of the record there are moments where you have spoken word with these beautiful, lushly orchestrated moments, but then you have uh, an ASAP Rocky feature, which uh, initially I felt was a bit out of place, but as I'm listening to this record more and more, I feel like it, it, it fits fairly well. And uh, you have Dev's falsetto vocal deliveries. Uh, just, I'm just waxing at this point about how great I think this record is. A track like Dagon and Dream has Heinz reflecting on being bullied as a child, and the outro of this track has a very powerful spoken word by Janet Mock. It's just an incredibly powerful record so well realized, effortlessly flowing. Dev Hines is just untouchable at this point. So good. And that is my August 2018 album review roundup. Lots to love this month, some stuff that I've liked less, probably some stuff to have an argument about in the comments section, so let's go and do that. On Tuesday on the Deep Cuts Discord, I'm gonna do a listening party of Foxing's Nearer My God. I know it wasn't one of the records I loved, but I feel like it's a record that a lot of people won't have heard. So this is an opportunity to come down to the Deep Cuts Discord, have a chat, listen to this record, and let's all have a discussion about that. Thank you for watching. I'll be back next week with a guide to PJ Harvey. Thanks as always for supporting this channel. See you soon. <laughs>